This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, meet a boy who doctors say almost didn't make it to his fourth birthday. We'll show you his journey through a heart transplant. Plus, we learn about a unique partnership in East Charlotte to boost literacy skills for struggling students and a new approach to helping the unemployed find work and stability. Please don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Med Center Air celebrates its 30th anniversary this year. The organization plays a huge role in organ transplants. In fact, Levine Children's Hospital performed more pediatric heart transplants this year than ever before. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser shares one little boy's story of strength. Two o'clock in the morning, a time when most children are tucked in their bed sleeping. But at this hour on June 11th, three-year-old Aiden Ellis lay on the stark white sheets of a hospital bed, preparing for the biggest day of his life, the day of his heart transplant. So for me, that was wonderful because at least I knew now, at least my son has a chance and opportunity. Aiden's mom, Miriam, remembers walking with the medical team to the doors of the operating room. In my mind, I'm just praying as we walk. The only thing left to do was wait. Turn the clock back to February when Aiden got sick and never got better. His mom rushed him to the emergency room. I was terrified because I was alone with Aiden. By the time he arrived, Aiden had slipped into cardiac arrest, his heart too weak to pump blood to the rest of his body. His organs were not getting enough blood supply. He basically had to be brought into the intensive care unit and be started on life support. Doctors put Aiden on a machine known as ECMO, which uses a pump to circulate blood through an artificial lung and back into the patient's bloodstream. For them to tell me that if he didn't go on ECMO bypass that night, he wouldn't survive the night. But the machine was a temporary solution, a band-aid for Aiden's failing heart. He was born with a genetic defect called cardiomyopathy. The uh, structure of his heart, the, the muscle, was sick from the beginning, and it worked until it couldn't work no more. By the time Aiden turned three, his heart could no longer keep up with him. A transplant was his only option. For the next four months, his mom and the doctors did all they could do, take it one day at a time. As a mom, I'm not sure what's gonna take place. I don't know how long we're gonna be here. I'm a single mom. I just didn't know what to do. Only thing I knew to do was to pray, pray for those that could take care of things that I couldn't. Fast forward to June 10th, when Miriam finally got a phone call with the news. Doctors found a match for Aiden. Carolina Healthcare System's Med Center Air played a big part in Aiden's story. 15% of missions for these planes involves organ transplants, allowing surgeons to stretch their boundaries from Michigan to Florida, bringing organs to patients whose lives depend on them. Time is extremely critical. Having access to airplanes can get us uh, basically into any hospital in the region. The main goal is to have the shortest time period that we can for the heart not to have a, a blood supply. And we can almost consistently keep that under four hours, which is a very safe operation. When it comes to transplants, every minute counts. Around the clock, teams are ready to go at a moment's notice. We always have two aircraft and two sets of pilots and medical crew members um, on standby at any given time. 12.30 p.m. Aiden comes out of the operating room with a new heart. Very emotional. Only thing I could think of is I have an opportunity to have my child back and have a life back. Aiden is one of eight children this year who received a heart transplant at Levine Children's Hospital. Named a best children's hospital in cardiology and heart surgery by U.S. News and World Report for the last three years. I'd see a miracle every day. I think a level of expertise that we have here and the passionate people that we have dedicated to what they do, um, it's a whole lot more than the surgeon putting the stitches in. I get a lot of credit for it, but there's a whole lot of moving parts behind the scene that makes that happen. Aiden celebrated his fourth birthday just weeks after the transplant. 
At a follow-up visit, he scoots around the playroom in a plastic car on the road to recovery. And what does green do? Make you go. Good, absolutely. That is like high five. Miriam enjoys every minute, remembering when her baby boy barely had the strength to get up from the hospital bed. Aiden would have not survived if, if he wouldn't have had the series of things that he did. As a parent, you come in with control and you have to give up that to people you absolutely do not know in order to gain the life of your child. I had to learn how to make peace within myself that I didn't have control, I had to trust. National data shows every 10 minutes, another person is added to the waiting list for an organ transplant. Aiden represents just one of the thousands of lives saved each year through organ donation. Aiden, do you have a birthday coming up? His smile, a bittersweet reminder of those who didn't get a and second chance. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Kosa so reporting. Awesome. Thanks so much, Danielle. Last year, more than 30,000 Americans received organ transplants. I'm proud to have signed up to be an organ donor. Have you? Mother Teresa once said, I can do things you cannot. You can do things I cannot. Together, we can do great things. I kind of like the way Rocky Balboa said it in Rocky One. When he was talking to Polly about Adrian, he said, she's got gaps, I've got gaps. Together, we fill each other's gaps. That's what's happening here on Charlotte's East Side. It's called the Center for Health, Education and Opportunity. And this summer, several agencies came together with one goal, to boost literacy skills for more than 30 struggling students. Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark tells us more. At 83, Norman Pollock enjoys riding his bike through his East Charlotte neighborhood. A retired college professor, he's got more time now to work on puzzles with his wife yes. the total. and tutor kids at a local school. I'm hoping that this is going to really help them get a start in life. Up the hill. I'd like to get them interested in reading, yeah. you know, for pleasure. The, the reading is a pleasurable activity, not just work. So we try to have a little fun with it. Well, they're penguins, aren't they? This summer, Pollock, along with other residents at Haldersgate Senior Living Community, volunteered at a reading camp for rising second and third graders at Windsor Park Elementary. Every lesson they get is exactly the lesson they need. As Dean of the College of Education at UNC Charlotte, Dr. Ellen McIntyre and graduate students from the university assess each child before assigning them to a reading partner. The seniors are reading aloud to the children and defining words, helping them with vocabulary along the way from great rich literature and allowing the children to then practice in the small books that they were using in their lesson. This is all part of accomplishing Read Charlotte's goal of doubling the number of third graders reading on grade level by 2025. We find these kids to be bright and talented, yes, but they have some barriers, one of which is many of them English is not their first language at home. Not to mention nearly all the kids attending this Title I CMS school live in poverty. Often it means children will then be struggling with literacy too because often the, the two go hand in hand. According to the 2014-15 North Carolina School Report Card, Windsor Park received a D in end of grade reading. And that's why teacher David Flores says most of the students here need extra help. For these kids specifically, it's they struggle with reading. Um, they're below grade level because they don't, you know, they're not there with their peers. Um, so our, one of our jobs is to show them that, yeah, reading takes a lot of hard work, but it's also fun. In addition to reading, the camp also factors in time at the Johnston YMCA where kids get to take swimming lessons, something many of them might not have the opportunity to do at home. So how did this collaboration with the YMCA, UNC Charlotte, and Aldersgate start? Tim Rogers works at Aldersgate Senior Living Community and in 2015, he led a nine-month study in partnership with the Foundation of the Carolinas, looking at two primary questions. What are the conditions of life in East Charlotte as we encounter them, and what can we do about that? Rogers says Aldersgate wanted to be part of an effort to revitalize the East Side, which for years has struggled with health and education disparities. We have a very engaged resident population. They're very familiar as they travel about with where we are and, and what East Charlotte holds in terms of perception as well as opportunity. 
Aldersgate plans to turn the 6,500 square foot building, formerly known as the Shamrock Senior Center, into the Center for Health, Education, and Opportunity. The summer reading camp was the center's first initiative. I think the program is just something that was an unexpected windfall for Windsor Park. Principal Lauren Finley says reaching the kids at her school involves a three-pronged approach. It really takes that um, cross-agency reach to make sure that kids are being supported not only academically, but also socially and physically. And I think that's, that's the one thing that I'm most excited about this program is that it really does all three. Name. Name. Yeah, you got it before, and now you're going to get it again. Volunteers like Pollock, who give up their time, makes a pretty powerful statement. I just think it really makes our children understand how important they are and that there are a lot of different people who are willing to help them become better readers and better students. Well, that's a good thing. Organizers hope to make this type of summer camp a model for future literacy programs. We believe now we can spread that throughout East Charlotte and really throughout the region. Tim Rogers believes the center will connect people with needs to those able to help. Our seniors and seniors everywhere are an untapped resource of great wisdom, great energy, great vitality, great caring, huge hearts. Let's put that into play to make all of our lives better. As for Pollock, he hopes that by sharing his love of reading with these kids, inspires them to work harder. I'd like that to be what we're doing with the children because you bring a whole lifetime to this table and they bring a very short lifetime to the table. So you'd like to help them get oriented to the world and get going. And going in the right direction often takes another person helping you catch up and get back on track. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenbark okay. reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. The Center for Health, Education and Opportunity plans to officially open in early 2017. Well, joining me now is Bill Anderson, Special Assistant to the Dean of College of Education at UNC Charlotte. Bill, it's always a pleasure to have you here. It's good to be here. Thanks for having us. You're always working on things that are making a positive impact for children in our community. Help us understand how this is making that positive impact as well. At the end of the day, we know that many of our third graders, by the time they finish third grade, are not on reading level. So, and it's all downhill from there. Well, our community has made a major commitment through Read Charlotte that we are going to raise all third graders to be on grade level by the end of third grade. Because if we don't, they have increased odds of, of dropping out of school and not graduating, not being able to raise up to socioeconomic standards and levels, and, and the rest of their life is, is more troubled than it could be if they could read on that third grade level. It's one of the best indicators we have for ongoing success in school, that students have to be on grade level at the end of third grade. So our community has taken that on as a major initiative, and this is part of that initiative. And in these troubled times, it is good to see something that seems to be working. Can you give us some, some ways to prove that this is working? Absolutely. Um, we worked with over 30 students at Windsor Park Elementary School this past summer for four weeks. Our summer reading camp was a four-week intensive camp in, uh, intended to improve literacy for these students. All the students that were selected were well below grade average. And when you take average students, they gain second graders, they gain about one and a half words per week our students gained 2.3 words per week, I'm trying to put it in as simple mm -hmm. um, statistics as possible. So we know that we had below level students and they beat the average significantly. So we know that it works and we know the model works because we were able to train teachers in a model that clearly uh, works for students. Now we were only able to train a limited number of teachers on this first round. Correct. Will this be expanded and is this program replicatable to have positive impacts throughout our city? It is absolutely, uh, a, we want to replicate it, we want to expand it, but anytime you expand a program such as this, you need the resources. So we're gonna report out our resources. progress. Money, 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 money. Yeah, money, money is a nice, re resources is a nice word for money, but yes. But you have to understand, we had four partners that were heavily involved in this. UNC Charlotte, the College of Education, and our reading professors, our dean. Our dean's really the impetus behind all this. This is her baby, this is her dream. Uh, the Aldersgate Retirement Community, where our Aldersgate 
partners, became reading partners. It was and so it was, great to see them in the it, story. It was phenomenal how well that worked, but they weren't just there being nice, they were actually reading high quality literature to these students. Also the Johnston YMCA came in and every afternoon the kids traveled from Windsor Park over to Aldersgate for summer camp swimming, all the activities of summer camp. And for these kids, it was like going to a country club, going over to Aldersgate, it was wonderful. And then of course our partner is CMS. Our superintendent, Ann Clark, was behind this completely. They helped provide transportation, buildings. So it was, a, it was really a thoughtful way of putting four groups together with, the, with an intended design to improve literacy and we had great success with it. And this was the first round, and it's great to see that they were gaining new words, yes. but the real test will be this academic year Absolutely. to see if we can test higher, to see if that outcome can really continue on the trajectory that it's headed. If I could add one thing, the principal at Windsor Park, Dr. Lauren Finley, is so big on what we're doing that she has asked us, UNC Charlotte, to come and train more of her teachers this year, and that's something we're gonna take on. So how long and how far we've got a lot of a lot of elementary schools yes. do we have sort of a tiered dream even though i realize we don't have the finances yet but we have that plan that we would like to be able to roll out two more schools next year three schools the year after that how do how do we make this plan and make it uh, happen we're in those conversations right now um, we're telling our story and you're helping us tell our story to read Charlotte and a number of the large philanthropic funders in our community to help fund this. As you know, there are many different reading programs, but we're able to prove with data that what we have done is working and working very well. Bill Anderson, you have been helping academics in the Charlotte area for many, many years. We Thank appreciate you. your continued uh, support and it's always exciting to be around something that's making a difference. Thank, Thank you, you for all the work Thank you, you very do. much. Well, you know, looking for a new job always requires lots of effort, but it gets even harder if you've been out of the workforce for quite some time. Now, for nearly 50 years, Goodwill has helped lots of people across the Piedmont find work. The Goodwill Opportunity Campus opened this summer, offering lots of resources for job seekers all under one roof. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzas reports and tells us more about what's going on inside. While planes take off at nearby Charlotte Douglas Airport, a new era for Goodwill takes off in the Piedmont. When most people think of Goodwill, they likely think of donation centers or retail stores. And of course, that smiley face logo. But whatever your perception of Goodwill might be, chances are it's about to be different. It's a game changer, absolutely, for the, our community and for our clients and for um, the west side. Welcome to the new Goodwill Opportunity Campus, a 160,000 square foot center located off Wilkinson Boulevard in West Charlotte. I think it offers a lot to a lot of people. I think before long everybody in the city of Charlotte will have a reason to come to Goodwill for something. The new facility opened its doors this summer. So what makes it unique? Well, let's start with the facility itself. The cost, $22 million, 14 million of it paid for by Goodwill, the other 8 million by donors. It's the first of its kind. You know, we've put a lot of time and effort into not only location, but what are the different elements of the building itself, the campus. The driving force for the new campus was the region's poverty levels. According to Goodwill officials, in the year 2000, 9% of Charlotte residents lived in poverty. That number today, they say, is closer to 15%. In this community uh, that we were losing the battle uh, when it comes to changing the trajectory of poverty, the key component of the new facility is the Job Resource Center. Here, clients can get help with resume writing, apply for jobs, meet with career counselors, and take classes on a number of subjects, all free of charge. We really began to refocus our efforts to long-term retention and advancement for the people that we serve. The new campus provides a comprehensive collection of resources for job training, job placement, and job creation, especially for those facing employment barriers, such as lack of skills, education, experience, and criminal history. And so we realize if we don't help folks address those and get stable, the chances of them being able to maintain that employment, even if they get the employment, uh, are not very great. One of the classes offered is in the construction lab, complete with all the tools and equipment for clients to train. We believe wholeheartedly that training is the core to success. Also here, you'll find Goodwill University's School of Retail. Here, employees learn all the necessary skills to work at a Goodwill Center. It's the first formal mock store of its kind. 
the employees love it. They feel valued. They are very excited that, that Goodwill is spending the time and the energy and the money to be able to train them to be able to be great contributors the moment that they arrive at the store. When I walked into the store, I was really surprised because it is set up exactly um, the way a lot of the uh, Goodwills are set up. Joe Perez has been working with Goodwill as a donation processor. He's now on his way to becoming a manager. Since the program's been in play, um, I've been able to take advantage of some of the classes that, the, that they offer, um, such as a leadership uh, program that they have and a, an Excel class. There's also a community space, a Charlotte Metro Credit Union, and a community health clinic, all under the same roof. And what would Goodwill be without an actual Goodwill store? Here they have two of them, including one with fashionable clothes, such as men's shirts, dresses, sunglasses, bracelets, accessories. And with all of these people coming in and out every day, about the only thing missing is food. Oh, look, they thought of that too. The Community Table Bistro serves breakfast and lunch to employees, job seekers, anyone on campus. We realized on the Western Corridor, most of the food options are fast food. Um, and we wanted to be able to provide our clients, customers, and staff um, some diversity of food. Here they have main dishes, sides, salads, drinks, and desserts, all at pretty reasonable prices. Well, you have to get here early for the banana pudding. Okay. Yeah. They're even growing their own vegetables in the courtyard out back to someday serve in the cafe. And perhaps the coolest part is the fact that seven of the bistro's nine employees are former clients who came to Goodwill searching for work. The goal now going forward is to use the bistro as a training ground for those looking to get into the food industry. So we'll design a curriculum around training those individuals specifically in how to handle food, how to prepare food, knife skills, food prep. Set to open later this year is the Play and Learn Center, a child care center for parents to use while utilizing Goodwill services. Some folks have asked, uh, did it meet your expectations? And, and honestly can say it's beyond our expectations. Goodwill officials are obviously thrilled with their new facility. They're confident the people of Charlotte will be as well. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. The Goodwill Opportunity Campus has nearly 250 employees and serves an average of about 120 people daily. That's a 32% increase over the numbers served at their former Career Development Center on Freedom Drive. Next up, you're about to meet a man who taught art at Central Piedmont Community College and Wingate University, but then he went back to school to pursue a graduate degree in fine art. Carolina Impact's Russ Hunsinger shows us artist Jeff Pender who spends hours in his Mooresville studio creating ceramics. The creative endeavor is one of our most important qualities as being human beings. Without the creative spirit, we wouldn't be human. I'm a ceramic artist. I've been doing this for approximately 15 years. My main focus is my sculptural pieces here. They're abstract forms, and the shapes and forms of the pieces, really, it took me a while to figure this out, but relate back to doodling that I used to do when I was in elementary school. Shape, at least, comes from this doodling process that I use when I think about ideas and draw out shapes and forms, and out of that came this shape. But the title of this piece is Dragonfly. What I try to do, or what I would like to do, at least in the sculpture, is give the viewer or the person, uh, the consumer of art, a little bit of referential material. So they might see a shape that's a little bit recognizable. They can't quite place what the shape is, maybe. And then when that happens, their mind takes over, their imagination takes over, and they create their own personal narrative with the work. This one's called Spirit Bird. And so that's where the sort of the cycle is complete. Me as an artist making the work and putting my efforts into it, and my eye is into it. And then the viewer, they take it from there and complete the cycle, complete the idea. And I was thinking, why, you know, why can't I make a sculpture that's a very interactive that people can touch on a regular basis like they would do you know, every morning with a handmade coffee cup? And so I started thinking about that and he came up with this uh, totem concept and each block moves independently from one another. I create this series of lines on each block 
and the lines line up from block to block, hence the title Endless Line Totem. And then they move independently of one another, so the art lover who has this piece can change this up on a daily basis. I'm very excited to be able to talk to the people that purchased the work. I recently sold a piece and uh, had the fortune of really talking in depth to the person who purchased it about why they liked it. And when I told them what it meant to me, they were even more thrilled to get you know, the backstory behind the piece and why it was you know, my inspiration and things of that sort. I think that's the, really the great thing about art is that it can help us see the world in new ways and it can open up our minds and imagination in ways we can't really think of. Imagine where the world would, would be without artwork. It would just not be a very, uh, nearly as interesting place. Thanks so much, Russ. Now, if you'd like to meet ceramic artist Jeff Pender in person and see his work, well, here's your chance. We're giving away tickets to Charlotte Contemporary featuring 100 artists from more than 30 states, and Pender's gonna be there October 14th through the 16th at the Park Expo in Charlotte. To enter, all you gotta do is friend us on Facebook, look for this post, and in the comment section, tell us why you'd like to win. Our friend Steve Turner says he wants to go because his imagination is always looking for new worlds to explore. That's a pretty good one. Plus, don't forget, you can watch tonight's stories and past Carolina Impact stories by going to our website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.